Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today is Thursday, April 4th. Happy April. Let us uh, bless before we dive right back into our study. Baruch Ata Anonai Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Kitshanu, B'mitzvotah Vitzivanu, La'asok B'divrei Torah. And uh, we are grateful for this chance to do a deep dive into our sacred literature. Um, through the study of Talmud, we experience the kind of hive mind of the Jewish tradition, um, a collective conversation or collected conversation spanning centuries and geography and different communities of scholars. Um, so last week we began our spring semester by looking at uh, Tractate Megillah, Duff 7 a, which is the, the beginning of the daf, or toward the beginning of the daf, we actually started a, a couple of sugya down, uh, sugya meaning a section or a subject. Um, and we spent the entire time exploring how this tractate of the Talmud um, wrestles with the divinity or perhaps non-divinity of a few, we'll call them controversial texts that are eventually included in the canon of Tanakh, of Hebrew scripture, nevertheless seem to have uh, accrued some uh, something of a reputation for being on the border between divinely inspired writ or just the product of a brilliant human imagination. Um, the Chief text, as the name of the tractate might suggest to you, um, that being Megillah, is the Book of Esther. Um, the tractate that we're looking at last week and this week is our way of exploring the Talmudic literature on Purim. Um, and we will get to some of the signature mitzvot of Purim today, but we have more to discuss in terms of the the subject that occupied our entire time last week, the the text itself, and is it divinely inspired or not? And if so, how do we know? How can we prove it? The rabbis are rarely content to make a claim without uh, proving it. And the way in which they prove it is a helpful reintroduction to Talmudic logic and hermeneutics, or the mechanics of making meaning, in this case, out of a text. Uh, so that's uh, that's where we were last week, and that's what we'll pick up again with this week. And uh, in the conversation last week, the Talmud also discussed the status, again, similar terms when we talk about status, we mean, yes, we know eventually these texts are canonized, but were they divinely inspired of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs, all of which are attributed um, to King Solomon the Wise. And um, where we ended last week was uh, in, I think, well, I have it right in front of me, so I won't misquote. I will actually quote. Uh, this was the statement of Shimon ben Menasia, uh, who claims that Ecclesiastes is, in fact, uh, the words of Solomon, but not necessarily of the divinely inspired Holy Writ uh, nature. Um, and that and that's the debate. And and what where we ended was well, uh, uh, not with a conclusive, definitive answer, but with the kind of the Talmud leaning in the direction of saying that, look, we know that King Solomon wrote a lot, but only which that which ended up in the book, um, out of the thousands of sayings of Solomon, was the divinely inspired part. Um, so th that's where we left. Um, and now we're going to get back to um, the book of Esther. Uh, so I will bring on screen our text and we'll go back into it. So this is Megillah 7a. Um, so it, looking again at the, the Aramaic here, this word Tanya is the Aramaic form of uh, the root meaning to teach, which is actually in Hebrew, it would be uh, derived from the word Mishnah. So it was taught, and here they add in the gloss, in a baraita, meaning a Mishnaic era 
extra Talmudic text, not one that is or extra Mishnaic text. So what my buddy Jeff Salkin, a reform rabbi recently retired, likes to call is God's cutting room floor, except it seems that the rabbis of the Talmud had some kind of access to the cutting room floor documents as well. Whether these were actually cataloged as scraps of parchment, I guess we don't know, um, because our primary record of Baraitot is in the Talmud itself, where they are frequently lifted up and quoted uh, for the purpose of proof texting. And that's what we're doing here. So it is taught in a Baraita, meaning we're, we're appealing to an earlier source of, of wisdom or of learning that Rabbi Eliezer, one of the early sages, says. The book of Esther, and, and again, this is not too hard in the Hebrew, Esther, meaning the book of Esther, not the person Esther, but Esther, the Ruach HaKodesh Ne'emra. So um, those of you who are familiar with the construction of Hebrew uh, sentences can tell the difference between verbs and nouns. Um, Ruach HaKodesh, we talked about last week, that is the divine spirit or divine inspiration. Ne'emra means uh, it's the passive form of omer or amar, which means to speak. I've highlighted the root, aleph mem resh. So ne'emra means was spoken, passive past tense. So Esther in the Ruach HaKodesh or the divine inspiration was spoken. Uh, in Hebrew, particularly in classical Hebrew, you can invert the order of subject, predicate, object, you don't have to. So you kind of sound like like Yoda, who talks that way. Um, so Esther was spoken through divine inspiration. Shin Ne'emar, as it says, or as it, and then we're going to have a quote. Vayomer Haman Belibo. And every time we say Haman's name, you can boo or stomp. Um, Haman said in his heart. So that's going to be the proof text that Esther had to have been a divinely inspired text. We're going to have some fun today as we try to figure out how the rabbis formulate their arguments. So there is a verse in the book of Esther that informs the reader that Haman had a thought. So the, the way in which the Bible typically uh, denotes a person thinking something to oneself is through the phrase amar belibo. Literally, he said in his heart. But colloquially, we would say he thought to himself. He had a thought. Now, think like a rabbi here, not, not like this rabbi. Think like, like a smart, wise rabbi from antiquity. How is the text declaring that Haman thought something proof that the script, that the book was divinely written or divinely inspired? Again, forcing you to think like a rabbi. Okay, mom and dad, you want to give a crack at this? Well, if it wasn't by divine inspiration, how would you know what Haman is thinking? Bingo. That's it. That's it. You got to, it's just logic, right? It, it's rabbinic logic. How could the, how could the text know this? How could the author of the book of Ex Esther know this, whoever that may be, unless it was divinely inspired, right? How could you know what Haman is thinking? Now, we're going to see these arguments come out because if he didn't say it, right? So, and the idea of an omniscient narrator is one that we're all familiar with, right? We read books all the time and just assume that the author has the privilege to narrate, has the prerogative to narrate in a way that reveals not only what the characters are doing, but also what they may be thinking. Um, but when it comes to scripture, when it comes to Bible, there's only one omniscient author, as it were, and that is God. So it must have come from the mind of God to inform the reader that Haman had a thought. All right. So when Haman, and, and this is important too, because Haman's design proves abjectly perilous for the Jewish people. So this is not like a side point in the narrative. This is a major turning point in the plot. This is when Haman comes up with the idea, hey, I think we should kill all the Jews. So it's really important to see how the rabbis think through these problems. Okay, that, that's all. We're going to have some fun with this. There are going to be lots of rabbis trying to outdo one another in their um, acumen 
as they go through the rabbinic art and science of proof texting. Okay, Russell, you're on, please. I love this. Does this mean that all fiction is divinely inspired? <laughs> you have the right to, to ask that question. <laughs> the question it's, itself takes us down a rabbit hole. Yeah, I love it, though. A rabbi that, hole. This is a case I've, I've been making for pretty much even long before I was a rabbi. One of my very first conversations that I can remember from my rabbinical school days, I had been uh, kind of hired, though it's a it's a match process, to serve as the rabbinic intern at a very small congregation in Williamson, West Virginia. This is my very first pulpit. It was a high holiday only pulpit. So it was Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And um, somehow dinner time conversation, I guess these folks weren't used to having a rabbi with them. So they wanted to ask really good like rabbi questions. And somebody said, Rabbi, I don't believe in, you know, any of this stuff that we're going to be reading and the binding of Isaac. This was an Erev Rosh Hashanah dinner at the president of the congregation's home. Why do we read this? Why do we study this stuff anyway? It's all just fiction. And I said, well, and this is sort of off the cuff, but I remember the conversation well enough that, and my answer seemed I don't know if it satisfied them, but it really satisfied me. So I've returned to it many times, which is I said, well, I'll give you a few reasons why. Um, one, because it's the Jewish birthright. Like this text may not reveal much about the creator of the universe or the divine. For many, it does, by the way. But it always reveals something about what it means to be Jewish. And that's why we study it. Secondly, um, you know, I believe that great art, great literature is a window into what I am comfortable calling divine, the divine nature or divine inspiration. Disclaimer, I would say as much no less for Mozart, Shakespeare, Lao Tzu, like, it, you know, it doesn't, it does not have to be. I don't think that only our scripture is divinely inspired. I think great art uh, anything that elevates the human spirit or comes from something more than just our cellular matrix is is a way we can reasonably talk about such art by using the words divine inspiration. I'm comfortable with that. Um, I think that's all I gave them. I think he said, well, that's not enough for me. I said, okay, I'll see you in shul. <laughs> like, okay. Some people really want the value that we ascribe to this this thing we're doing right now, this study of our sacred text to be kind of like, but I want to know the literal mind of God. I said, well, if you come into it with that, you're probably going to come away disappointed. Um, Anne, please. You have to unmute, though. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking, what about Hitler's book, Mein Kampf? Didn't he write that? Was that divinely inspired? Well, no, 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 I'm not saying all works are divinely inspired. Only the ones that I, John Blake, deem to be subjectively great literature. No, I mean, you get to decide. Human creativity, it, I am comfortable talking about the spark of human creativity in religious language. Sociobiologists are not, except the ones that are. <laughs> and And... And I'm I'm not really joking here, but I'll say it in a way that signals that I I accept this with with humor. Um, my buddy Shai Held, uh, great rabbi, uh, the CEO of Hadar, the wonderful um, community of learning and study, prayer, uh, and and Jewish leadership in New York City, likes to say the minute you throw Hitler into a conversation, you've changed the game. Like. It's like you can't really make many arguments for from analogy using the Holocaust or Hitler. Um, his point being that some um, some things are sui generis. In other words, they don't make for good comparisons because they are of or they are their own category. Uh, Arlene, and then uh, and then we go back to the text, please. I think that if you approach the Bible in a very concrete and literal way, you're going to be disappointed over and over again. But if you look at it and say, well, what can I take from this? What, what really relates to the human experience in some fashion, even in terms of the binding of Isaac? I see that as 
a situation that goes on between parents and children and how do you set up that relationship? So, you know, if you're going to be concrete, yeah, then you want to dismiss all of this stuff. Yeah, I I arrive at very much the same place in my, you know, approach to what this all means and why we do this, this thing called, you know, Talmud Torah. Um, I would add that for the rabbis who are writing this, I go back and forth as I read passages like the one we're going to be learning today, we are learning today, and ask, are the rabbis doing this because they enjoy the intellectual game of it? Is this just fun for the rabbis? Or did they really believe that they had a responsibility to prove uh, either to themselves or their audience, the the both literate and illiterate masses of the Jewish people, uh, that this text matters specifically because it was written by God or communicated by God. I shouldn't say written. A lot of this, you know, it's it's interesting to begin with that the language of this uh, this tractate of the Talmud, Megillah, speaks so extensively about Ruach HaKodesh, literally the, the holy wind or the divine spirit, uh, divine inspiration. I like that because it preserves the idea of breathing, inspire, to inspire literally comes from the same root as respire or expire, has to do with your breath, perspire. Um, so I don't know, maybe a little bit of both. I, and maybe not uniformly among all of the rabbis, since there are, you know, hundreds, thousands of them. Um, what did they believe about the meaning of their project when they're trying to prove that a text is divinely inspired? Um, hard to say. Um, though I, I lean toward the rabbis having more than just a fun uh, sport of this. Uh, okay, right. so there is a playfulness, though, in the uh, rabbinic uh, art of proof texting. And, and I think you'll pick that up as we move forward. So, so this was the, so the proof text here is that well, because Haman thought something to himself, and this fact is disclosed to the reader, it must be divinely inspired, right? Because as my dad said, how else would we know? Okay, moving on. Rabbi Akiva Omer, um, now Rabbi Akiva, who was a contemporary of Rabbi Eliezer, he, uh, and again, in Safari, you can just hover your, your uh, cursor over the name of a rabbi, click on it, and then go to the sidebar and it tells you about when Rabbi Akiva lived and some of his greatest hits, um, one of the martyrs of Rome. Okay, Rabbi Akiva Omer, Esther Baruach HaKodesh Ne'emra. So he also claims that Esther was written with the Holy Spirit or divine inspiration. Shin always it always sets up a proof text, as it is said, and now they're gonna quote a verse that Akiva will use to prove that Esther was divinely inspired. Okay, here's the verse. Vatahi Esther no seit chen be'ene kol roeha. So this is uh, Esther chapter two. This is actually when we are first introduced to the, the woman who will become Queen Esther. Vatahi uh, Esther no seit chen. Literally, Esther, it, it came to pass that Esther carried favor or was seen favorably, be'ene kol roeha, in the eyes of anyone who saw her. So this, this is a very strange, elongated and poetic way of saying she was really hot, maybe. <laughs> but it, but it, it, goes, it probably goes beyond physical beauty, though I think that's part of it. So anyone who saw Esther found her favorable. Why is this a proof text for the divine nature of the text itself? Okay, hint. It's the same answer as before. Mom and dad, right. Unmute. I was about to say it's the same answer. <laughs> How would you know? How would you know that literally every person who saw Esther found her favorable? This is in the days before social media. It's not like people could go on Instagram or take a picture of her and say, wow, look at Queen Esther. I find her favorable. <laughs> it doesn't, right? So 
again, the the and again, the rabbis, that's why I say I think the rabbis are approaching this with a sense of play. Um, that it is not just or sport, intellectual sport. It's like, okay, I've got one. I've got a proof text here. Haman thought to himself, aha, proof that only a divine author, only a divine inspiration could account for knowing what was in Haman's mind. Another rabbi, Akiva in this case, comes along and says, aha, I've got a better proof text. Although it's interesting to say, he doesn't explicitly say mine is better, but clearly they're playing some kind of game or sport here where he says the proof that it is divinely inspired is that the text informs us that everyone who beheld Queen Esther found her favorable. How could you possibly know that? Again, unless today we would talk about an omniscient narrator, right? The narrator of the book, the author has created an omniscient narrator who knows everything and can say such statements without us batting an eye. And, and the way we read literature is very different from the way the rabbis are asking us to read literature. So the rabbis are saying the rules of reading biblical literature are our rules. We have rules for reading biblical literature. And for us, 21st century moderns who have been saturated in literature from birth, we have to set aside our assumptions about how literature is read and how meaning is constructed out of the art of reading literature. Okay? So... That, and that's why I thought that even though Purim is now a couple weeks in the rear view, it would be meaningful to set up this specific set of sugyot, this part of the Talmud, to lead us into our spring semester. Because especially on the hopeful assumption that some newbies have joined us and welcome, welcome back. Uh, if you weren't scared off last week, we're delighted to have you. Or if you're viewing us, we had a couple new subscribers to the YouTube channel. So if you're watching this for the first time and you just decided, hey, I'll learn some Talmud, but I'm going to start on session 26. I do feel a sense of responsibility to help acclimate you to the weirdness, the, the strangeness of this literature. Uh, Mom and Dad, your hand's still up. May I uh, loosely quote you on <laughs> sure. the teaching of what it means to speak authoritatively as a Jewish person? And yeah. you said, we're none of the religious... Um, milieu where I can wake up and say, I had a divine inspiration in my dreams last night. And so I know what God wants. Right. You also can say, I, Rabbi John Blake, have decided that this is what this means. This is according to me. So this is the truth. He says, what you can do is to refer to others and then build on their logical arguments. So I That's guess right. if there's a question there, is this a unique development in the history of religion? I mean, there are all kinds of pantheisms and Eastern religions and everything, but this seems to be a, a an original approach to how religion is conveyed. Um, a, I accept your loving and and accurate quotation of uh, of me. Uh, <laughs> um, yes. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do the Talmudic thing or the rabbinic thing and attribute it to my source. When I was in, uh, just spending a lot of time in walking down memory lane, um, which I guess is is entirely appropriate. Um, uh, but uh, my second year of rabbinical studies in Cincinnati, uh, dean of students then uh, Rabbi Ken Ehrlich. Uh, no, this was my third year, third year, second or third year homiletics class. Must have been second year, my first year in Cincinnati. Uh, and we talked about in Judaism, what is the source of the authority of the preacher? And the, and the distinction was made that in Christianity, not all Christianity, but in many, particularly evangelical Christianity, it's entirely accepted. It is, you know, within the normative uh, mores of modern day evangelical American Christianity for Joel Osteen. Uh, to stand up in front of his 20,000 faithful at some, you know, mega church stadium and say, brothers and sisters, the Lord spoke to me in a dream last night, and this is what God wants me to tell you to do, right? So the mechanics or the, the, the cultural assumptions around divine inspiration are, it is an accepted norm that a preacher can do that and can say that and is not laughed off the stage. And Dr. Ehrlich's point was that don't try that on Yom Kippur, kiddos. 
Like, remember, I'm 23 at the time. We're still we're first learning about how to be a preacher, and he said, "You can't do that in in a synagogue. You can't say the reason you should believe me, Jewish congregation." He always cited. He said, "Yeah, when you're the rabbi of when you're the assistant rabbi at Congregation Rodef Kesef." That was always his like stock example. It's a very funny in joke. Um, you know, like Rodef Shalom. Uh, Rodef means to pursue, and Kesef is money. Uh, so <laughs> when you're the rabbi of Congregation Rodef Kesef, those who pursue money, this is pretty funny. He said, when you're the assistant rabbi, don't get up oh. there on Shabbat, much less on Kol Nidre, and say, the Lord spoke to me, and here's what God wants you to do. The authority of the preacher in Judaism rests on the text and the ability of the preacher to quote his or her sources. There is a second, there is a place though, he added, and this is the one kind of like, it's not a correction to your comment or I'm, I'm not being misquoted, I'm being quoted accurately, but also lived experience of the preacher is valid too. Like I have found that if I can get up on a Friday night and say, look, um, here's why you should take this from me. One, because it's Jewish and here are my sources. Two, because I have had this lived experience as a human being, as a rabbi, as a Jew, that allows me to make my argument in this direction, right? And, and so, but that that's why rabbis tend to get better as preachers with age or have the opportunity to get better with age because they have more lived experience. Karen. Um, yeah, I don't want, I feel like I'm just being argumentative, which is a Jewish thing. I, I very, suppose. it's very Talmudic. You're, you're welcome and to be it, argumentative here. And very enjoyable in my day. Okay. So the thing is, if you, we could figure this out, namely you and your dad, um, why couldn't they? In other words, what was their mindset? Was it simply that they needed an authority and this gave them all the more authority when they could say, this is divinely inspired and we know it? Yeah. Or, but, but, but wouldn't they, wouldn't they want to not abuse authority? In other words, wouldn't, why would they see this as proof of, of, of divine inspiration if you could say, but it isn't, it's just a way of speaking. It's a way of presenting information. What do you think? And is this a rhetorical question that I'm asking? It may be a <laughs> rhetorical question. Um, I yeah. have always, look, I am strongly and unwaveringly in the camp of those who believe that the ability to refer to the divine quality within a work that was clearly written by human beings is not predicated on literal authorship. Okay, so okay. in other words, I believe that human creativity is a window into, as it were, and I'm using this term poetically, as I always do when I talk about God, or to quote my wonderful teacher, Rabbi Jack Stern of Blessed Memory, God, comma, however you choose to understand God, which he always said when he wanted to make a claim in the name of God. Um, I believe that the mind of God can be apprehended through through human creativity. Um, there are others for whom that is simply, not, it's not that it's not true, it's that it's insufficient. People really, it's like, uh, they really want like, no, 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 signed by God. <laughs> they, and, they, and, and I think that leads you down some very problematic uh, uh, intellectual lanes. Uh, namely that, you know, well, how can you tell the difference between when the Bible is speaking literally and when it's speaking figuratively? I was having this uh, discussion with, oh, so, someone just yesterday. It'll pop into my mind. I don't want to spend a lot of time teasing it out. But it was exactly this. It's like, wait a minute. Anyone who tells you they're a Bible fundamentalist can be, uh, you can retort, oh, really? Well, what about this verse? Like when the book of Deuteronomy says, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. That, that can't literally be done. So what do you mean you're a Bible literalist? What did God mean if you really believe that this is the word of God? I'm, I'm, I have a much easier time with that one, just saying, what extraordinary poetry this is, right? What a, what, what a genius to come up with the idea that just as we might circumcise our flesh of the foreskin, so too a person might have a thickening around 
his or her heart, as it were, emotional deadness, a failure to apprehend beauty, wisdom, truth, whatever, and that the the book of Deuteronomy is adjuring the reader, scrape it away, resensitize yourself to the beauty and power of human existence or whatever, right? And the ability to write in metaphor for me is proof positive that you can't read the Bible literally. And the, and the writers of our literature were highly sophisticated writers who I think reveled in, in the art of literature, Judy Gross. I'm just thinking of the storytelling that exists. So we, I took the course with Rabbi Reeser of the of the Bible as literature. But don't all religions have some kind of stories? The Bhagavad Gita is a story. Absolutely. And it's by Krishna and Arjun. And so that's part of how the populace can absorb and remember stories. And the more details, the more they get into the memory that so that it can be carried on. Yeah, and that's a nice response, not a rebuttal, but a nice response to my dad's comment about, well, is Judaism unique in this regard? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think Judaism may go to the furthest extent of any of the major world traditions um, in its willingness to treat the literature as kind of like a flexible template for drawing out meaning, as opposed to an authoritative message that one should apprehend from reading the text at the surface level. But, you know, that's more a question of relative emphasis within Judaism to other traditions. And because I'm not expert in all the other traditions, I I withhold judgment at this time. Okay, uh, so, so let's go back and look and see where our game is going here. So now we have two possible conjectures for how how a reader would know that the book of Esther was divinely inspired. And remember, there's also the, we're doing the what today and the how. I would remind us that last week was really about the why. Why is this important? Well, for starters, Esther is the only book of the Bible that doesn't include the name of God. And that immediately raises eyebrows. Now, what is this literature? Secondly, there's the fact that the book of Esther is, besides the fact that God is not in the text, it's a very irreverent text. It lacks the reverence that one associates and can demonstrate in pretty much every other book of the of the Bible. Even a book like Ecclesiastes, which is also up for grabs in terms of divine inspiration or not, at least according to the conversation in this part of the Talmud, even the, the book of Ecclesiastes is not really played for laughs. The book of Esther is quite intentionally, I would say, by design, a laughable book. Um, and I think that that's part of the authorial intent behind it. Okay, so that's the why, possibly, that the rabbis are trying to establish or they're wrestling with the idea of how can this irreverent, risque, satirical book without God, how can you prove that it's actually godly? And now they're having a game of it, right? One says, well, we know what Haman was thinking. That's proof. How could you know that? Or we know that everyone who saw Esther thought she was beautiful. How could you know that? Okay, let's move on because we're going to see more of more of the same, and it really is rather fun. Rabbi Meir Omer. So here's Rabbi Meir, and again, it looks like we're quoting the same Baraita because you can see uh, if you checked out uh, the bio of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Meir was roughly contemporaneous. Um, we're still going way, way back, right? If you look at a text that's written in the middle of the second century of the Common Era, which is, that is still Mishnaic. Mishnah, you may recall, for those of you who've been long haulers in, in our study, Mishnah was written, you know, compiled by around 235. So the first half of the third century. So we're still quoting pretty early sources relative to the full expanse of of Talmudic writing. Okay, Rabbi Meir, what does he have to say? Esther Beruach HaKodesh Ne'emra. You can see now that we have kind of like a formula that's been set up. They all begin with a rabbi who's introduced by name, trying to prove that Esther Beruach HaKodesh Ne'emra, the book of Esther was written or was spoken, was communicated through divine inspiration. All right, what's Meir's proof text? Shne'emar, also part of the formula. It's setting up, here's my quote. Okay, Vayivada Hadavar le Mordechai. The matter became known to Mordechai. 
All right, again, we're looking at Esther 2.22. And if you're doing this on Safaria, which is really such a wonderful tool for study, you can just click on the verse here and it takes you in a sidebar over to it. So um, you can see what matter we're talking about. Look back one verse. You always have to find your context. And you see, So Mordechai was hanging out in the, the gate of the city. So the entrance to uh, the palace, rather. So um, you have these two eunuchs uh, who go by the names Bigtan and Teresh, uh, the two uh, palace eunuchs, Mishomre uh, Hasaf. They they guarded the threshold, presumably of the palace. So they're like the, uh, you know, the uh, the palace guards. And what did Mordechai overhear? Um, he heard them plotting to do away with King Ahasuerus, with King Ahasuerus. Mordechai, and then it, the next thing it says, um, The matter became known to Mordechai, and he immediately tells it to Queen Esther, and Esther reported it to the king in the name of Mordechai. And they investigate the matter, and it was found to be so. And the two, meaning the two eunuchs who were guarding the palace, were impaled. Uh, this was recorded in the book of Annals at the instance of the king. So the king had this officially recorded. All right. All well and good. This is still part of kind of like the exposition at the beginning of the story of Esther. Um, but what does this prove about the divine nature of the text? Now, if you're getting good at this game, you'll know the answer already. How does this prove that this was divinely inspired? This one, in my view, by the way, is a stretch. <laughs> Mom and Dad, okay, let's see if you can get three for three here. Well, I would, <clears throat> I would like to say it's because you know Mordecai threw found this out through God's inspiration, but in fact, the text is quite clear that he overheard the guards plotting. So you know he's around the quarter when these guys are cooking up this scheme, and he overheard them. That's why I think it's nothing sucks to do with the text. divine inspiration here. Right. That, that's why I'm not persuaded by this proof text, but I think that's actually what Rabbi Meir wants you to conclude. Like, how could he have known that they were actually plotting to do away the king? And I'm like, idiots. It tells us. He overheard it. But you don't need divine inspiration for that. So, But just the, the fact that they make the argument doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good argument. <laughs> right? I mean... I'm, I would say, well, not all Talmudic arguments, not all rabbinic arguments are equally good. Subjective. But that's, you know, I could imagine Akiva going, saying back to Rabbi Meir, even though they lived, uh, you know, they never crossed paths. Akiva was, was executed by the Romans uh, for sedition or for teaching Judaism publicly. Meir came along after that. But nevertheless, the Talmud posits that you can have a conversation between rabbis who never met in real life and who are separated by geography and centuries even. I can imagine Akiva coming back and say, really? That's your proof text? That's a terrible proof text because, again, it, look at the text itself. He didn't need divine inspiration to figure out that there was a plot against the king. Um, it just Now, again, this is, this is important. It only tells you that Mordechai was sitting at the palace gate. The text does not actually say he heard it. So that's where Meir has a window cracked very slightly open to make his case that, well, how else could he have known? And again, I would have said, idiot, he's sitting right there. He's literally at the gate of the palace. And these guys are, I don't know, inches, feet, meters away. It doesn't say they were whispering, and he just heard them. But, but the text doesn't explicitly say that he overheard. It just says, Mordechai was here. These guys were there. They were nearby. Next thing you know, Mordechai found out that they were plotting to do away with the king. And I'm like, well, idiot. The narrator put him there. So it's In other words, this is a rabbinic interpolation. I think that the, the regular reader probably has better judgment than the rabbis here. Just saying, no, he's sitting there. Of course he overheard it. Okay. Okay, but what's the takeaway here? The takeaway is that not every rabbinic argument is necessarily good on its logical merit. 
All right, let's let's read on. Let's see what happens next. All right, uh, so, um, whoops, I want to close out my sidebar. That's how you do it. You just hit the little X and your sidebar collapses. Okay, the thing became known to Mordechai. And again, as Steinsaltz tells the reader, in case you need it, this too could have been known only through divine inspiration. Well, maybe. Or maybe he just overheard it. Okay, reading on. Rabbi Yosef ben Durmaxit. Dur Durmaskit. Uh, that probably means the son of the Damascus guy. I've never heard of this guy before. And you notice it just says Rabbi Yossi. When I click on it, this one says Rabbi Yossi ben Khalafta. So unfortunately, whoever set up the link here linked to the wrong rabbi. Uh, this is a different guy, I think. Unless these are interchangeable. I've never heard of this name before. Ben Durmaskit. Like Steve Maskit. Where's Steve today? We miss you. All right. Here's his proof. The book of Esther was said with the inspiration of the divine spirit. Let's see. Durmaskit. Weird word. Okay. Esther Beruach HaKodesh Ne'emra Ne'emar. Okay. Here's the text. Uva biza lo shalchu et yadam. Let's see what this verse is. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. So he's jumping all the way to the end of the book. And, uh, some of you may remember this, and Karen and Dave, you were at my uh, Sharing Shabbat Adult Study, the weekend of Purim. Uh, so you may remember that we studied Esther chapter 9. Um, what happens is after Haman's plot is foiled, uh, Haman and his sons are hanged, or perhaps depending on how you translate the phrase talui al ha'etz, uh, ha which might mean hanging from a tree, but it could also mean impaled on a wooden stake. There, the the Hebrew is actually ambiguous enough to permit either translation. But either way, they do off they do away with Haman and his ten sons, and then uh, the Jews are granted permission at Esther's behest to go out and kill the people who were going to kill the Jews, and they do this for like several days, and they rampage. We talked about this last week. They kill seventy five thousand Persians. But the text informs us in verse 19, they did not lay their hands on the spoil. They weren't doing this in order to enrich themselves. It was as it were, the, the reader is intended to, uh, I think, assume that the action was justified. That it wasn't just a war of plunder. It was a war of self-defense. Um, so again, the question arises, how is this proof that the text was conveyed through divine wisdom? The fact that they didn't lay their hands on the spoil. Okay, I think my dad has gotten the hang of this. So what's your answer, dad? I'm not going to answer the question, but okay. the thought occurred to me that uh, the next thing you know, Netanyahu will quote this as uh, as proof text for what's going on in Gaza. Uh, yep. Okay, I'll let your editorial just stay <laughs> as it is. There, there seems to be very little that Netanyahu won't say. Okay. Uh, any any guesses on this one? I'm not. It's not a trick question. It's 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 all of a it's all of a piece with what we've been doing today. Same answer. Same How answer. They, they How would you know? It. How would you know? All of the they killed seventy five thousand people. It's war, right? It's total chaos. It's a melee. It's a bloodbath, and not a single Jew took like a trinket. How could you possibly know this? All right, that's his proof text. Um, and you can say what you will. Maybe this is why Rabbi Yose Ben Dermaski, or whatever his name is, is not a very well-known rabbi. But okay, that's his. You can see the rabbis are all playing the same game here. It's like, I'm going to show you a text that proves that, that that could not have been known except if God had a hand in the, in delivering this narrative to the Jewish people. Okay. Are we having fun yet? Let's go on. The other, uh, Judy, other Judy wants to speak. <laughs> okay. Judy, Judy last. Thank you. I don't always see the actual hands. I see the digital hands. Judy, what's your thought here? I was thinking when I was listening to it that it is a wonderful rationalization for the Jewish people to go ahead and get accolades for doing what they wanted to do because they would really wanted to kill the 75,000 people, and it's not a nice thing to do. So it's kind of nice to make it up and say that it comes from God when, you know, 
We know that Mordecai is sitting there and he's going to darn well tell somebody to set up Haman. So I think in a way, the divinity really comes from the fact that Mordecai was sharp. He said, let's see if we can do this. And then we look like we're wonderful people and we haven't done anything bad. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that and just kind of run with it. And thank you for sharing. Look, it's interesting that the rabbis seem, in their way, to be writing God back into the text. Do they not? Right. And again, I think that you can't dismiss the fact that Esther is unique in its absence of God. And it's clear that the 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 motivation for the rabbis here is their discomfort with that fact. Like, we're really? We're going to include a text in the Bible that has no mention of God whatsoever? And perhaps, were this war divinely commanded, the rabbis would have, the ancient rabbis, not this rabbi, but the rabbis would have found it easier to swallow. As things stand, a war that kills 75,000 after a, foiling a genocidal plot by Haman that did not, importantly, did not come to fruition, in this, at this point in the story, the only people who have died are Big Tan and Teresh, the eunuch palace guards whose plot to kill the king was foiled, which establishes Esther's authority as a as an aid to the king very early in the text. Esther and Mordechai therefore become trustworthy, both to the reader and to the king. Right, so it's part of character development, or it sets up the future plot. But it's, but it's not really the big thing in the book of Esther. So in a war that the Jews theoretically could have won without bloodshed, the ninth chapter of the book of Esther posits that, no, they went on basically an orgy of bloodshed against the Persians who would have executed them all at Haman's directive, but did not. I can imagine that the ancient rabbis were not comfortable with any of this. And perhaps by writing God back into the story, it becomes more palatable for them, not for me. Okay. Okay, let's see. Let's see what happens. Now you get Shmuel. And Shmuel, we're going to see, just click on his name. He's actually from a later generation. So he is not a Tana. He's an Amora. Tana is an Aramaic word that means a, a reciter, one who had the tradition memorized and would actually spit it back out. Though clearly the Tanaim were much more than regurgitators, they were discussers as well. But Amora explicitly means a discusser, from the word Amar, to say. So rabbis who are teachers, rabbis who are reciters, rabbis who are discussers, but the important thing is not just what, but when, right? So he's fully a century after the previous uh, voices that have been cited. And, and that is also indicated in what he says. So when Marshmuel, e havai hatam, if I had been there, okay, if I were around when these guys were doing this fun game of proof texting, Hava Emana Milta, and we notice we've moved from Hebrew to Aramaic. I wouldn't say you notice, but I notice. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're now in Aramaic. E Havai Hatam, if I had been there, Hava Amena Milta de Adifa Mikulhu. All right. What does that mean? I'm not very good at Aramaic, but fortunately, there's a translation here. I would have stated a matter that is superior to them all. <laughs> I have a better argument than all of these guys who came before me. What is that argument? Shene Mr. Okay. Kimu Vakiblu. Two words. Just two words. All right. Um, what are Kimu Vakiblu? Kimu comes from the Hebrew root Kayam, which means to establish, and kiblu comes from the Hebrew word kabal, like kabbalat shabbat, which means to accept or receive. Kiblu, uh, kimu rather, they established, the kiblu, and they accepted. What is that? We know that it's a quote from the book of Esther, because that's, that's the conversation. Esther 9.27. Well, a good student of text will click and look it up. What you used to have to do through most of my rabbinate, you'd actually have to have a Tanakh by your side. You're reading Talmud out of an actual book, and then you have to go, oh, let's find Esther chapter 9, verse 27, look it up side by side. That, that's the way you study, but Safaria just makes it easy. Um, okay, let's take a look. What is this? Oopsie. What is this verse? All right. Kimu Vakiblu. 
Uh, well, going back a verse. For that reason, these days were named Purim, after Pur, which means the lot, or the lots. In view, then, of all the instructions in the said letter and of what they'd experienced in that matter and what had befallen them. So they're talking about the the um, the promulgation of the king's decree, um, and they've killed Haman and his sons, and now they've given the holiday a name. They're, so they're establishing Purim as an observance in perpetuity. That's the point of this passage, right? This is the part in the text itself where Purim becomes a thing that Jews do forever and ever and ever. And that's significant. In view then of all the instructions in the said letter and what they had experienced in that matter and what had befallen them, Kimu Vakiblu, here's we get to it. Kimu, okay, which interestingly, our text even gives us an alternate translation. Vikabal or Vikiblu. So, um, it's it's kind of it's clear that somebody has a problem with the text here. The text these brackets mean that we're not sure this doesn't help us here. That's a dictionary. The text is not clear on who's doing the uh, establishing and who's doing the accepting. Except here it says Hayyehudin. Okay. Um, Alehem the al zaram the al kol. So the Jews undertook and irrevocably obligated themselves and their descendants and all who might join them, so all of the Jews by choice or people who just hang out with the Jews, to observe these two days in the manner prescribed and at the proper time each year. So we're talking about the perpetual establishment of Purim as a Jewish observance. But the text has a problem, or the rabbis have a problem with these two words, kimu the kiblu. Um, it appears to me, and I would need to go into an actual Megillah, which I did not bring home with me, um, but I believe that the tradition is that the word is pronounced kimu, they accepted or they established, but the text actually says vikabal, which means he established. So there's some disagreement here over who's establishing the holiday and who is accepting it. The for me, it's not actually that difficult. The common understanding, the colloquial understanding is the correct one. The Jews, Kimu Vakiblu, they established this holiday and they took it upon themselves to perpetuate it for all of their generations. Easy. But for the rabbis, this strange formulation of is it Kimu or is it Vikabal? Who's doing the establishing? Who's doing the accepting? You're going to see how uh, the rabbis or this rabbi Shmuel understands it. He says they confirmed and took it upon themselves, which was interpreted to mean they confirmed above in heaven, sorry, what they took upon themselves below on earth. That is the traditional understanding of what happens at the end of the book of Esther. It, it, it solves a few problems. Namely, it writes God back into the text and it establishes the legitimacy of the Purim holiday, which otherwise has no divine mitzvah, divine commandment, to enforce it. So rather than saying the Jews did two things, they established it and they received it, the rabbis are over-reading or hyper-reading the text. I would say they're reading the text hyper-literally. In biblical language, when uh, the author wants to make a kind of poetic or a stylistic emphasis, they'll just come up with two words, right? Um, the Lord is a warrior, yea, a great battle god is he. Like, this, this is very, that sounds biblical because that's the way a lot of biblical poetry talks. It says the same thing twice. I've studied a lot of biblical poetry and my best conclusion is it's a stylistic device for emphasis. Um, and look at the Psalms. It, it puts these two verbs in parallel as the dominant structure for almost every Psalm. I will give praise unto God, yea, I will sing out God's name. Like that's very Psalmaic. That sounds like Psalms because that's what Psalms does. Verb one in clause one, parallel with verb two. It's just, I'm repeating it for emphasis, but to the rabbis, no repetition 
can be without meaning. There has to be a deeper meaning. So why Kimu Kiblu? It's not that the Jews did two things. It's not that the Jews established and then accepted a holiday, which is redundant, needlessly redundant. The argument here is that, no, 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 the divine court established it and the Jews accepted it. Problem solved. You no longer have a redundancy in the text. You have a verb. You have two different verbs corresponding to two different actors or two different subjects. God established it. The Jews accepted it, right? So you, the 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 syntactic problem is resolved, as well as the theological problem. We've talked about this. The overarching theological problem of the Book of Esther is that God's not in it. Therefore, how is this part of our canonized scripture? So Shmuel says this is the best argument of all. If you read it the way I do, that God established the holiday, and the Jews accepted it. That knowledge could only have been conveyed through divine inspiration. Otherwise, how do you know that God established the holiday, save for the fact that the text tells you so? Did I lose anyone in this craziness? It's okay if I did. It, it is, you have to, again, this is a game called think like a rabbi. Yeah, not like this rabbi. I would never expect you to try and think like me. That would be an exercise in absurdity. Um, but it's, it's soup up there. But... Think like an ancient rabbi. Kimu v'kiblu can't be. Can't have two words that mean the same thing. There has to be an independent actor, an independent significance to these two verbs. God established it. The Jews accepted it. Problem solved. Now we know why there are two verbs. And God is written back into the text. All right. Clearly, as Steinzalt says, it is only through divine inspiration that this could have been ascertained. Mom and dad, your comment goes here. This puts it in, in consonance with the rest of the Jewish calendar festivals, doesn't it, in a sense? Yeah, indeed. That they're, you know, mandated by God and the Jews accept it. And it's exactly. going to happen every year at this time. So now That's you're right. now you're just like you're just like Pesach and Shabuot and you know the right. rest. That's right. And by the way, similar, we didn't get to do this this year because of the war, but I had a lesson plan teed up for the late fall about Hanukkah. Um, Hanukkah is also a bit problematic. Um, it, it, the story of Hanukkah is told very, very, it happens late, as it were. It happens in the second century BCE, the early second century BCE. So it's probably the last thing to be mentioned in the Bible, but it's not mentioned directly. And so the rabbis probably struggled with the status of Hanukkah as a holiday because it is de Rabbanan and not de Oraita. In other words, there's no reference in the Torah or for that matter, anywhere, there's no direct reference to observing Hanukkah. And the rabbis, in their modesty, do not like to arrogate authority to themselves, um, at least not in an explicit way. So if the rabbis are trying to make the case that, hey, Hanukkah has a standing on the Jewish calendar, they have to give you a reason that's better than we fought a war and we won. They need God to enter the story. Right? This is my point about Hanukkah. So what do the rabbis do? They actually tell you that the real reason we observe Hanukkah in every generation is not to commemorate the Maccabean victory, the Hasmonean victory over the uh, Seleucid Greeks, but rather to commemorate a miracle wrought by God and only by God. And so this is, I would say that, Dad, your point is consonant with the Hanukkah example, which, by the way, even today, it's common knowledge that Purim and Hanukkah are quote unquote minor Jewish holidays. And this is a big part of why. Like their their mandate for their establishment comes from after the Torah is completed. They're not in the five books at all. Unlike pretty much all the other ones, even if we observe them differently, Pesach, Shavuot, counting of the Omer, Sukkot, uh, the uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, I'm like, what other Jewish holidays do we have, um, are all in the five books. And um, Tu Bishvat is rabbinic, minor holiday. Uh, Purim, rabbinic, minor holiday. Maccabees, definitely rabbinic, minor holiday. Tisha B'Av, not Torah, but scripture. The destruction of the temple in Jerusalem is recorded in the Book of Lamentations. So Tisha B'Av is actually, I would say, higher up than Purim 
to be shvat, uh, and why am I blanking? What's the third minor? Oh, Hanukkah. Right? So it's common understanding that Jew- Jewish communities have minor and major holidays, and this is why. Uh, okay, I saw Anne's hand, and I think I saw Karen Shields raising a hand as well. Yeah. Okay, Anne, you can unmute little, your little, I have a little question. Which Go for is, it, and then we'll take Anne after you. What about, what about Shabbat? Shabbat is Torahitic all the way, many, many times. It's, it's a holiday? No holiday. The most no. important holiday. The mo- yeah, that's what I thought. But you didn't and it's, it's not just because, like, you know, kids learn this in religious school. Shabbat's the most important holiday. Well, one is because yeah. there is a rabbinic uh, maxim, a rabbinic axiom that says, that which is regular takes precedence over that which is irregular. Hmm. Which, is un- which is interesting. Because sure. actual Jewish behavior is often the other way around. It, to, <laughs> in a community like WRT, you know, over a thousand households, the majority observe Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The majority may not observe Shabbat. So for, for modern day Jews, the irregular takes precedence over the regular. But Shabbat is, uh, I would say, definitively kind of like the Jewish holiday observance par excellence strictly on the merit that it is commanded by God multiple times throughout the Torah. Like right. <laughs> every book of the Torah talks about Shabbat observance. It would, it, it's, it's the opposite of Purim. It is from the mouth of God. It is mentioned several times, and it's Torah, which is the, you know, the mother load of Jewish wisdom. Uh, Anne Cohen. I'm a little confused mm-hmm. about, if I, I'm more than a little confused I'm a little confused about the about the dreams, you know. Not didn't Joseph have dreams that that turned out to be true? Uh, sure, I think that I'm following your logic here, but it might help for you to clarify it. It seems that you're bringing dreams, and I haven't mentioned dreams. I I think you're bringing dreams into this because they it logically flows from the argument. How do we know that God wants something from us? Yes. I, yeah. Um, well, at least to Joseph keep... had a dream. Joseph had a dream in prison. Yes. Lots of biblical characters, all of the patriarchs and Joseph are dreamers. Um, and there are others. Um, I don't know if Moses is ever associated with dreams. And yes, the Torah concludes in the patriarch narratives that God communicates through dreams, but uh, fortunately, there are there's only one dream in the book of Esther, and it's Achashverosh is sitting on his throne and he's having a terrible nightmare, and to soothe his nerves, they bring in a palace official to read his ledger. Like it's literally like I'm I have such bad insomnia now. I have this terrible nightmare. Please soothe me back to sleep by reading me an insurance policy. <laughs> and, and this happens, I think, in the fifth or sixth chapter of the book of Esther. And so they're reading this long, hellaciously boring document so that the king can fall back to sleep. And in the document, it's like, by the way, on such and so day, Mordecai saved the king's life by foiling the plot of the palace eunuchs. And the king is like, oh, my God, this Mordecai is a big deal. And that, again, moves the plot forward. But Fortunately, no holiday is established on the merit of a divine dream communication. Lots of things can be said about the role of dreams and does God communicate through dreams, but none that is particularly relevant to today's argument, which is probably why the Talmudic rabbis don't refer to dreams as a proof text for the divine inspiration of this text. Okay. Thank you, though. Let's move on. Uh, Okay, so here we are. This is Shmuel saying, if I had been around, this would have been the best proof text of all. And then Rava, and again, look at his timeline, uh, even later than Shmuel, a hundred years later, quite nearly, fourth century, oopsie. Um, there is a refutation for all of these proofs. In other words, Rava says, look, all of the proofs we've heard so far, you can actually refute them. You can push back and say, no, not so much except for Shmuel's. There is no refutation. So here you have an an authority a hundred years later saying, 
on balance, this idea that the text tells us that it was established by God and accepted by the Jews, that Purim should be a holiday forever and ever and ever, that's the one proof text no one can refute. The Gemara elaborates. That which Rabbi Eliezer said with regard to the knowledge of what Haman was thinking in his heart can be refuted, as it is based on logical reasoning to conclude that this was his thinking. Right? That's just logic. That's not divine inspiration. We know that Haman is a genocidal maniac. We know this. So it is logical to conclude that he had a thought in his heart that was malign toward the Jews. Right? So that's his point. Ellie, the point that Rava is making here is, I can refute all the other ones. You don't need to insert divine inspiration to account for why a character might think something. You can deduce it from the rest of the text. Logic. Logic being the opposite of divine inspiration in the way the rabbis are talking here. There was no other person as important to the king as he was, meaning Haman. And the fact is that when he elaborated extensively and said, let the royal apparel be brought as he does, he said it with himself in mind. So in other words, we have these examples where Haman's words and actions are dispositive of what he's thinking. You don't need to invent a divine inspiration. God does not need to enter the text for the reader to have knowledge that Haman might have thought something that is consistent with his words and actions. Follow? That's just logical. Okay, Rava, I believe, uh, continues. That which Rabbi Akiva said. So Rava is going to shoot down the arguments of all of his predecessors, save one. That which Rabbi Akiva said with regard to the knowledge that Esther found favor in the eyes of all, perhaps it can be understood and refuted in accordance with the opinion of Rabbi Elazar. So he actually has uh, an outside source who said, this teaches that she appeared to each and every one as one of his nation, and they expressed that sentiment aloud. So there's a folk tradition that Rabbi Elazar uh, is citing that whoever beheld Esther thought that she was one of their own. Therefore, she found favor in the eyes of all. In other words, you don't need to know the literal mind of every single person who ever laid eyes on Esther to reach this conclusion. And therefore, divine inspiration is not a great argument for how the reader knows this or why the text says this. Following how this all works here? This is Talmudic logic, my friends. Okay. And that which Rabbi Meir said, namely that the divine inspiration of the book of Esther is clear from the fact that Mordechai exposed the conspiracy against the Chashverosh by his eunuch guards, perhaps this can be explained and refuted in accordance with, and again, he's bringing in the outside opinion of one Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, who said, Big Tan and Teresh, the eunuch guards, were both members of the Tarsi people, and they conversed in their own language. Mordechai, who was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish elite court, and therefore fluent in many languages, understood what they were saying. So that's why I, I thought of all of the arguments, that one was the weakest anyway. It's like he could overhear it. And even if it was in a foreign language, he could understand it. That's That's all they're adding here. In other words, again, it would be, there are logical or rational explanations that account for what happens in the story where one does not need to write God back into the text through the mechanism of divine inspiration. Okay, that's how that's what's happening in this passage here. Moving on. And that which Rabbi Yossi ben Durma, Durmaski, I don't really can't say that name, said with regard to the knowledge that no spoils were taken. Remember, that was his argument. How could you know that none of the Jews took booty from the, from the war? Perhaps this can be explained and refuted by the fact that they dispatched messengers who informed them of the situation. In other words, no. They had scouts on the battlefield who came back and said, the Jews rampaged against the Persians, but they didn't take any spoil. <clears throat> so whereas we had made the argument, aha, you couldn't possibly know that one Jew hadn't taken some spoil. The counter argument goes, no, this you could know this. You could send out a messenger to figure it out. Okay, but, <clears throat> excuse me, however, with regard to Shmuel's proof from the fact that they confirmed above what they took upon themselves below, confirmed in the heavenly court, took it upon themselves in the Jewish community on earth, there is certainly no refutation. It says, you're right, that one is airtight. 
Ravina said, this explains the folk pit. This and this is all leading to one takeaway. Like if you have to study a lot of Talmud before you get something that you can just put put in your pocket and use in casual conversation, right? None of this is casual conversation material. If you want to study Talmud, you got to be all in. And so, my friends, if you just joined us last week and then dropped because it's a little intimidating, like stick with it because every now and then you get such a gem that you can do this. Aha, I'm saving this statement for a rainy day. So what's the statement? Ravina looks at all of this discussion that we have literally spent an hour and 15 minutes on. We've, we've not made it very far today, but that's okay. That's never my point. I'm always about, let's really go deep. Let's, let's really look at these texts and what's happening here. Ravina. Okay, here's your takeaway. This explains the folks saying that people say, one sharp, oops, one sharp pepper is better than a basket full of pumpkins. Here, here it is in Aramaic. Pilpalta, this word, is a pepper. In modern Hebrew, a pepper is a pilpel. So in Aramaic, it's a pilpalta. Pilpalta charifta mimeleitsane kare. Pilpalta charifta, and, and the word for spicy in modern day Hebrew is charif. So if you want to make sure that, you know, you get the spicy sauce with your falafel, you can say, mild charif babakasha, like make it really spicy. Charif is a word that everyone knows, but it also, spicy, like in English, can be used not just, it can be used outside of a culinary context, right? You can have words that are charif, which usually means sharp or painful, right? Charif, spicy. Pilpalta charifta, I'll get, I'll get the rest of it since Aramaic is not my first second or third language. Pilpalta charifta mimeleit sane kare. One spicy pepper is better than a whole basket full of pumpkins. Okay, somebody translate into plain English. What does this saying mean? In the context of the last 75 minutes of today's discussion, it's all been leading to this. Pilpalta charifta, one spicy pepper, is better than a whole basket full of pumpkins. Okay, mom and dad. Not that I mean to monopolize this part of the conversation, but um, yeah, a sharp, pungent, precise argument is much better than a bunch of mushy counter texts. There it is. That's it, right? Um, and by the way, to this day, Dave, you want to comment here? Put well, another way, Occam's razor. Occam's razor. Say say more about Occam's razor. One of my favorite rhetorical and intellectual. Well, premises. from the medieval, William of Occam said, uh, "The simplest explanation is the best explanation." Right. So, let's have one Occam's razor argument. Let's have one really sharp, insightful, direct. In Occam's case, simple, but the razor, right? Something that really cuts as opposed to a whole bunch of arguments or proof texts that aren't so good. Looking at you, Rabbi Meir, not so good to claim that the fact that the text tells us that they didn't take any spoil from battle is definitive proof that God must have written the book. But the fact that, again, you have to go with the rabbinic creativity and how they read it, but the fact that the text tells us that the divine court established and the Jews accepted that Purim would always be a holiday? Game over. I'd come up with the best argument. So again, what is this? Is this fun? Is this sport? Do they really believe? Are they really talking about divine inspiration? Or, as I will now submit, are the rabbis really talking about how you make meaning out of a text and inculcating the value of a superior argument? of a really sharp argument. It's like, think through, you're going to claim that this text is divinely written. You better have something that is unassailable to prove it. I love, I love this. I say, I think it says so much about what the rabbis care about. And there's your little, put it in your pocket for a rainy day. One sharp pepper is better than a basket full of pumpkins. <laughs> um, and by the way, in traditional Judaism, uh, the, the term that will be widely adopted as the colloquial way to referring to Talmud study itself is 
peel pool. Peel pool, yeah. Which literally means, so you will sometimes see that, peel pool. Literally mean it is the colloquial way to refer to Talmud study. And what does it mean? It means hot pepper. So when, what we're doing here, like I could go and talk to my rabbi friends and at a meeting, you know, and they say, oh, what'd you do this morning? I said, oh, I had my peel pool with my students, with my Talmud class. They're amazing. Some of them are really hot peppers. Like, you know, like, and, and a badge of distinction for a Talmud student is to liken or to praise that person's ability to do pill pool, to really read it and argue like a hot pepper, which, of course, you could have a pumpkin soup, 100 pumpkins, just a little bit of hot pepper is what makes it sing. Otherwise, it's bland. Right, it's so fun. I love culinary stuff anyway. So the, the use of culinary metaphor to describe Talmud study, take that one because we'll probably come back to it time and again. Trish. So, of course, my head is spinning at this point. It Good. usually is. Uh, Did I lose you? Yeah, um, I can hear you, but I don't. Oh, there we go. Um, yep, you're so, here. So the reason I'm really confused at this point is that this particular argument that's supposed to be incisive, as in razor sharp, it started with confusion of words. So yeah. I don't understand how that can be the incisive argument. I don't accept any of the other ones either. Good. <laughs> Great. This in particular, I don't find convincing because it start. It all started out with words. And, kimu and this word, which I have to go back to the Megillah and see how it's written. And is there something in the grammar that suggests it should be written as the divine court? I'm so with you, Trish. So I, and I also want to say that I totally agree with Russell that all of these are not rabbit holes. They are rabbi holes and they should be referred to as rabbi holes. <laughs> Great. And forevermore. There was once a computer game that I was obsessed with as a kid. Um, anyway, it was one of those word games. Like it was before computers actually could make pictures and look nice. Um, but it was like, you know, you're in a dark room and what do you do? And you can type, go west. And like, okay, you approach a door, open the door. Like it's it's all this kind of a game, a text game. Um, these were very big back in the day. Kids today would think that they are hopelessly archaic. It had something to do with Mars. Yeah, right. Um, anyway, so I'm playing this game and... If you play the game long enough, you come across a device which is called the T remover. Um, and you don't know what it's for. It's just, it says on it, it's like a black box that says T, the letter T remover. And I don't remember what its point is, but you need it to solve a puzzle inside the game. But it also operates in the world of the game in very funny, silly ways. And there's one part where you can put a rabbit into the T remover and out comes a rabbi. So there you go. Um, yeah, uh, Trish, point very well taken. In order to accept that one argument here is like a sharp pepper, you need to be fully bought into the internal, the enclosed internal logic of rabbinic reasoning or midrash. Right? The rabbis are making meaning out of this through the same midrashic techniques that allow them to conclude, for instance, that when Abraham had the knife po posed over, uh, poised over Isaac's head, in the Midrash, there's a Midrash that says the angel began to weep and the tear from the angel fell and melted the knife and made it impossible for Abraham to slaughter his son. It was not that Abraham of his own volition withdrew the knife when the angel said, Abraham, Abraham, don't kill your boy. In what world is that possible? Only in the world of Midrash. I use it as an example for the fanciful nature of Midrash. And so, yes, there is, it, it has its own internal logic, but if you're not fully bought into the internal logic, it is entirely plausible to say, none of these arguments is particularly compelling. And one is not more compelling than the other. But within the closed box of rabbinic reasoning, Rava is at least willing to put himself forward and say, to the best of my ability to assess such matters, Shmuel has the sharp pepper argument and all the others 
comprise a basket of pumpkins. Oh. Thank you, Trish. Okay, uh, Russell, please. Well, I want to thank you and thank everyone for this extraordinary discussion, because what I find most fascinating about this, apart from the question of fiction, which, I, uh, which I'm thinking, is that this really tilts toward a much, much deeper question, which is, how do you know when God is present? How do you know when God is in our life or in our world? And what I find extraordinary is that the rabbis are using logic to try to prove that God was the author of this. They're saying, well, this person couldn't have known that. They're using reason to prove that God was there. And yet the events that they describe are mystical events. They are there. Um, they are you know, they are you know, someone knowing something that they couldn't have known or translating something they couldn't have, have translated. There is this, to me, there is this absolutely fascinating, uh, uh, almost uh, dialectic uh, between uh, the presence of God being revealed through some kind of spiritual or irrational or inexplicable phenomenon and yet using logic to extract that and thereby prove the existence of God. My favorite passage, I think, in all of the Torah is when God says to Moses, I will pass before you in a cloud and you can see my back. What this illustrates to me is that in each of these texts, you don't see God coming, but you will know that God has been there. <laughs> and, and so, so th those are the, those are my takeaways from today. Thank you for sharing them. What a great 1140 AM kind of comment. Um, and then Judy, please. And then Karen. Uh, I'm finding this very interesting, but I'm not grasping something, you know, it's, I want to move forward, but I missing, I'm missing something. And it reminds me of what my mother once said. It doesn't lay by me in the head. Fair. Um, the best remedy for uh, that kind of like Talmud fog that you're experiencing, and I, I think that, you know, many of us, myself very much included, uh, experience Talmud fog when I get deep into an argument and then I'm, I'm trying to come out on the other side and then I'm like, the hell did I just spend an hour of my life doing? <laughs> and, and what I can say is that uh, the patient learner is rewarded. The patient learner who's willing to come back again and again to these texts will be rewarded with new insight. Um, but so stick with it. Stick with it. But you know, my grandmother once said something interesting. She said, the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. Indeed. Well, there's that too. There's that too. <laughs> And, you know, and that's why Ben Bagbag, the improbably and delightfully named sage who is quoted in Pirkei Avot and like only in Pirkei Avot says, turn it and turn it again for everything is in it. So if you're going to get to everything is in it, first, you have to be willing to keep going back over and over and over again. Um, and, and I will say that, like, such is the case for what I'm writing right now. So just as a, like a little, I'm, I'm trying to come up with something nice to say tomorrow night, since the congregation is doing this very nice uh, service, and they're, they're acknowledging that I've stuck around WRT for a long time, and have, you know, uh, been with uh, my WRT family uh, over these 20, almost 21 years. Well, what does one say in an instance like that, especially knowing that other people are going to be saying things and we want to actually have dinner before 9 p.m.? So I'm trying to write a few very brief remarks. And unfortunately, I was, you know, we Jews have to live with our portions. And the portion this week is Shmini, which, among other things, discusses the laws of which animals are kosher to eat and the tragic death of Nadav and Abihu and not much else. And I'm looking at this going, oh, thank you. Great. That's the text I have to drush this week. I've got to do Shmini. <laughs> Shmini is notorious for being like the hardest one to unpack, but I view it as a noble challenge. And so interestingly, I spent the last two weeks reading and rereading parts of Shmini and going, there is nothing here. There is nothing here that I can use to say, thanks, it's been nice being your rabbi for 20 years. And then just yesterday afternoon, I saw a verse or two verses, Leviticus chapter 9, verses 22 and 23, 
If you want a sneak preview of what I'm talking about, feel free to read them ahead of time. I went and I said, oh my goodness, there's something in that verse, in those two verses that I've never seen before. So the patient learner is rewarded. Um, Judy Gross, please. And then we'll do one tiny little passage as our coda for today, which I think you'll find very interesting. Yes. This is a bit of a segue actually to what you're saying. When I have a hot pepper, I choke. <laughs> spicy. I say, am I going to go back and try another pepper and see what the effect on me is going to be? But I think that's also applicable. And, and one other thing is just the whole literature, the deus ex machina. This is, this is God as, right. as the, as the, the behind everything that's. Yeah. That's, I mean, you know, I love, I love that. I think it was Shmuel who begins his comment with the, with the, with the comment had I been there, this is what I would have said. And I often find myself wondering, huh, had I been there, what would have been my response here? My, so inserting yourself back into the text is, is part of the fun of it. And had I been there, would I have cared as much as the rabbis do about making sure that God is seen in the text? Because to me, that seems to be the, the project here. It, this stems from, I would speculate, this stems from rabbinic discomfort with the godlessness of Esther. There's just, knowing that, the machinations of the rabbis in this long page of Talmud make more sense, at least in terms of figuring out what is the project here. Okay. And with that in mind, here's your, here's your coda. So you would think, that when Ravina comes into the argument and says this great hot pepper, says one hot pepper is better than a whole bag of pumpkins, that should be where the passage ends, right? That would be a good, that's the kicker. That's the punchline. Ravina, you just killed. Like the audience is like, they, they're like, yes, you got it. Take a bow, move on to the next subject. But that's not how the rabbis work. <laughs> and therefore, we're right back to it in the next line. Rabbi Yosef clearly not able to read the room. Rabbi Yosef enters the conversation and says, well, actually, I have one more proof text. If I, if I were the rabbi like conducting an actual conversation among all of these sages from across the generations, after Ravina said, just goes to show you, one spicy pepper is better than a whole bag of pumpkins, I would have said, Shabbat Shalom, have a nice day. That's the end of that. But no, Rabbi Yosef, clearly not able to read the room, says, wait, I have one more argument that will tell you why we know that the Book of Esther is divinely inspired. And here it is. Rabbi Yosef said, proof that the Book of Esther was divinely inspired may be cited from here. You know, now they've, they've gotten rid of the Esther, the Ruach ha HaKodesh Ne'emra. They don't even quote the formula that we've seen six times previously. Okay. And these days of Purim shall not cease from the Jews, Esther 9.28. So it's even later. In other words, the, the, the text asserts that the Jews will keep this holiday forever and ever and ever. They will never stop. The Jewish people will never stop observing Purim annually. How could you know that unless it were communicated through divine inspiration? How could you possibly know what the Jews are going to do 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 years from the events of Shushan in the 4th century uh, BCE. And these days of Purim shall, or the 4th or 5th century BCE, shall not cease from among the Jews, an assertion that could have been made only with divine inspiration. And Rab Nachman Bar Yitzchak actually says, yeah, I think that's valid. And proof may be cited from here, from the end of that verse, nor the memorial of them, perish from their seed. So the argument, the subject actually ends with this little coda with two other rabbis who come around and it would be meaningful to see when did these folks live? Rabbi Yosef, okay, third generation Amora, so contemporaneous with Rava, and Nachman Bar Yitzhak, fourth generation Amora. So in other words, we haven't like leapt centuries and centuries into the future. We're still contemporaneous with the previous one or two speakers. And so these rabbis, again, clearly not able to read the room and realizing that Ravina, this wonderful line about the pepper and the pumpkins, 
had a had a conversation ender and they jump back in and say actually i've got one more argument for you and then that's where the subject ends and then should we decide to keep going with purim and i'll make a game a, no i'll make a decision a few days before um we get into the other mitzvot of purim next so again just sort of like if you were to kind of like look ahead in the text that actually is the end of the conversation about the divine or non-divine nature of the book and now we talk about uh the mitzvot of distributing gifts to the poor or matnot la evyonim um where the other mitzvot and remember this was all on one mitzvah of purim the mitzvah of hearing the megillah read and why would you take the time in this memorialized you know ritually uh observant way to hear a book unless God has something to do with it. So all of what we've been talking about for two whole weeks of classes has been about the mitzvah of hearing Megillah. But the Talmud remembers there are other mitzvot for Purim. You're supposed to send gifts to the poor, and you're supposed to do shlach manas, or shalach manot, mishloach manot, which means sending out portions of good cheer each to the other. That's like baskets of homentashen and other goodies. So there are two, at least two other mitzvot on Purim. One, to hear the Megillah. Two, to uh, send gifts to the poor. Three, to exchange portions of food. Um, and, and we either will or won't go into those because it might be time to start Pesach, which is going to be a multi-week exploration of lots of different texts and traditions. Uh, Barbara, would you like to chime in before we have to conclude our session today? Yes, I, thank you, Rabbi. I wrote it in the chat, but you didn't see it. I'm sorry, I did not see it. Okay, that's all right. Um, Nehem Ra to me, is feminine. Um, it wasn't Ne'emar. Yes, correct. And, so, ne but the, the, and that's because the subject is Esther. Oh. Esther, and it doesn't thing. say the book. It actually says Esther by name. So Esther, so, so uh, you're right. Good, good, good observation here. Um, that Ne'emra isn't the same as Ne'emar, it's feminine, whereas Ne'emar is masculine. And usually if you're citing a, like if the subject of the sentence is hakatuv, which means the writ or that which is written, Ne'emar, masculine has to be in agreement with the subject and verb have to be in gender and number agreement. So if the subject is like hakatuv, which means the text, Ne'emar is written, masculine, masculine. But since the subject of the line is always Esther, which is clearly the name of the book, but they're also, I think, using the name of Queen Esther, who is feminine, Neemra. Okay. Good catch. Thanks, everyone. Thank uh, you, Rabbi. I hope to see many of you over Shabbat uh, and wish you all Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye. Shabbat Shalom, Arlene. It was terrific again. Always. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.